tales for dark nights. Meets. Written by Kevin Thomas. Performed by Christopher Keegan. I saw my mate Ryan three weeks ago, for the first time in about five months. First time since I'd been thrown out of that gym, with the wreckage closing in on me. I nearly didn't recognise him on the crowded tube platform, with his grey hoodie over his head, and his big black bomber jacket that strained at the seams with the bulk of the man underneath. He looked terrible. His veins and arteries were so dark that they looked like they'd been drawn on. His eyes were crusted with that yellow powder. So was his nose and the edges of his mouth. His ears seemed blocked with the stuff. More than that, though, his arms and chest were huge and solid, inhumanly so. What? Ryan? I croaked. Ryan's head turned towards me. His neck creaked like an antique rocking chair. His dusty, yellowed eyes seemed glazed until they lit up with a brief flicker of recognition. His mouth tried to crack into a smile, but his lips moved with the stiffness of a ventriloquist's dummy. You could almost say it was the first time I'd ever seen Ryan, because before that night, Ryan had always been Wasp a nickname he'd earned when we were both about twelve, and he barged into me running away from a wasp's nest he'd accidentally disturbed when climbing on his auntie's roof. Wasp was a good mate. Mostly. He was shy, and positively awful with girls. Our first fight was just after I started dating my first girlfriend, Laura, and he revealed that he'd long harboured a thing for her. In his eyes, I was stealing her from him. Honestly, had I known in advance that he liked her, would have backed off. But he was acting like he was entitled to her just because he silently decided he liked her first. And that pissed me off enough to date her anyway. Not my finest hour, I admit. He wasn't bad looking, but he had a face that needed a good growth spurt to make handsome. He needed puberty to hurry and square out his chin and line it with some designer stubble. But it never did. See, when I was about 14, I went from 5 feet tall to 6 feet 2 and bulked out accordingly. Wasp, however, seemed to top out around 5 foot 4. We used to rib him about it, and he used to laugh along. But I guess he took it more to heart than we thought. Because pretty soon he started pumping weights. To be honest... For every good mate instinct I had to try and convince him that he was fine just the way he was, he did genuinely seem happier when bulked up. Within a few months, you'd never see him without a protein shake in his hand. He ate chicken fillets like some people chew gum, and he always carried an issue of men's health or gym fitness in his bag. Don't get me wrong, we still thought he looked like a knob poured into that tight t-shirt with a neckline plunging so low you could nearly see his belly button, and we all delighted in telling him as such as often as possible, but it gave him confidence, and I guess that's all that mattered. I mentioned our first fight was over a girl, but so was our worst fight. The summer I turned 15, I heard that Wasp's little sister Robin fancied me. I know, I know, sisters are off limits, but... I was young and stupid and hadn't really got a grasp of my hormones. The same genes that had missed Wasp had blessed his little sister with a petite figure and delicate features, all set off with deep blue eyes and dirty blonde hair. (laughs) We got together at a party, and when Wasp found out he was furious, he screamed at me, called me a bastard and warned me to stay away from her. I'm not proud of what I said next. 
I know it was a low blow, but I was so angry that you told me off in front of everyone I just lost my temper. Or what? I yelled in his face. What are you going to do, punch me in the shin? A few big laughs from everyone. I felt awful. I spent the next few weeks all but begging for forgiveness and promising to leave Robin alone. One day during a wait session, I guess he gave in. He squared up to me, flexing his growing arms, and he said, If what you said the other day is true, all the worse for you, because if I can't punch you in the face, I'm going to deliver one hell of a smack to your bollocks. With that, a big grin spread across his face, and he punched me in the arm before going back to working out. <laughs> it seemed like the problems were all done. But then he joined Meats. See, when Wasp had got serious about bulking up, he started touring the local gyms. My family had a group membership to this fancy gym on an industrial site just off the motorway. It was huge, with an indoor pool, an outdoor pool, tennis court, spa, sauna, the works. Even at a bar, cafe type place that always seemed far fuller than any part of the actual gym. I'd brought Wasp there once and he hated it. He couldn't understand why anyone would pay that much to spend 20 minutes on the cross ski and then two hours reading the Sunday papers once a month. Needless to say, when he found the gym he liked, it was a scuzzy, sweaty, male-only, 24-hour type place. All strip lights and free weights and tattooed guys doing endless squats. Before Wasp got as heavily into it, we'd call the other guys there wreck due to how much they looked like... <laughs> well, I'm sure you can figure it out. It was a place called Meats, because in the grand tradition of male-only gyms, they had to pick a name that could double for a gay bar. It was a small, converted warehouse surrounded by barbed chain-link fence. Car park was a mix of dirt and rubble with potholes that never seemed to fully dry out. The main shutter was permanently down, and the gym's logo had been crudely spray-painted over it, though it was now faded. The only usable entrance was a small side door, covered in chipped blue paint, with a window that had wire crisscrossed through it. Security didn't appear to be a major concern for what was essentially a room full of men whose idea of a fun time involved picking up incredibly heavy things and then just sort of putting them down again. So Wasp started going to meets, and carried on bulking up. But something changed when he started training there. After a few months, gone were the protein shakes and the chicken fillets, and his macronutritional protein bars. Gone was the permanent bottle of water he carried around. I thought maybe he'd given up, or reached his goal, but his bulking didn't seem to stop, or even slow. If anything, it sped up. He let his subscription to men's fitness expire and stopped drinking green tea, but his muscles didn't stop growing. Even girls started to notice. They used to look at him with flirty intrigue, but this was slowly turning into puzzled concern. The amount of bulk was concerning enough, but it was the speed at which he bulked up that was more worrying. Now don't get me wrong, we're still young, but still, this was happening on a scale of weeks, if not days. I mean, I swear I could see stretch marks around his biceps where his skin just couldn't keep up. I asked him how he kept bulking without all his supplements, and he grinned. The guys at meat sorted me out something new, was all he'd say. The breaking point came one day when Wasp fell down some stairs. It was nothing serious. He was too busy reading some news story about a suicidal man who jumped in front of a truck and just missed a step that sent him tumbling. He only fell a few feet, but the problem was how he landed. He put his hand out to break his fall, but his bag threw him off balance, and he landed on the outside of his palm, wrenching his elbow the wrong way. The sound was wrong. I'm pretty squeamish about these kind of things. I can't hear someone being sick without heaving myself. And that fraction of a second sound clip of that guy's teeth on the curb in American History X makes my balls hide somewhere in my large intestine. 
till my face was sucking a lemon at the anticipation of the sickening, squelching, dull crack I was about to hear when Wasp's arm broke. But that wasn't what I heard. It was sharper and louder and stiffer than I expected. It sounded like tree bark snapping, like a branch giving way when a kid tries to climb it. When I dared open my eyes, Wasp was just looking at his broken arm as it hung limply from its new bonus elbow. The break was bad enough, but the wound, it was bloodless. There was a good two inch tear in the skin that should have been gushing with blood, but it just hung open, flapping like torn wrapping paper. A fine yellowish powder dripped out onto the floor. I'll have to go, said Wasp shoveling the spilt contents of his bag back inside. No, wait, I called. You have to go to the hospital. Then I saw it. I thought it was a pen at first. But no, it was a syringe. Clear as day. Of course it was. How had it taken this long to figure that out? There's only one way he could have kept up the gains without all his powders and shakes. He was on steroids. That's what those chav wreckets had sorted out for him. Seriously, Wasp, come on. I tried to follow him, but he ran. I called him all afternoon and into the evening, but no answer. Eventually, I went round to his house, but Robin hadn't seen him. There was only one other place I could imagine he'd go. Meats. I pounded on the chip blue door. Membership number. Look, I'm not a member. I just need to know if Wasp... Uh, I mean, Ryan is here. Mem mem membership number. The wreckage behind the door mumbled again. I'm not a member. Is Ryan here? Membership number. Oh, hell, I don't know, 12? The door clicked open. As I said, security did not appear to be a major concern. I stormed past the wreck it working what passed for a front desk. In reality, it was just a fold-out table, topped with a wood effect plastic. On it sat a spreadsheet on a clipboard and a small blue strong box. <laughs> Quite the business empire. I carried on marching until I saw Wasp, bench pressing some obscene amount of weight. Another towering wreck it behind him was a spotter. I stormed over all ready to rip into him about steroids and abuse and getting his broken arm seen to. Wasp, what are you doing? Your arm. Stop calling me Wasp. My name's Ryan. What? Since when don't you like being called Wasp? I know why you call me it. Just because I'm small and annoying and pointless and I ruin everything, yeah? What? Of course not. That's, that's not the reason you damn well know it. Of course it is. And now you're just mad I'm getting bigger than you. Mate, when I met you, you were literally running away from wasps. How's it taking you this long to tell me you didn't like it? Yeah, whatever. It was this moment I realised all the other records had stopped working out and now had just sat on their equipment, watching our little domestic unfold. The room seemed bigger on the inside. The strip lights buzzed and beat down on the equipment, but the room's perimeter remained bathed in darkness. In those shadows, more of the wreckage swayed and watched. Look, Ryan, I'm sorry if you don't like the name. I won't use it anymore, I promise. I'm just worried about your arm. What about my arm? It's fine. Mate, I saw it snap. It was... By now, Ryan had set up on his equipment and was leaning forward with his hands in his lap. His arm was fine, save for a particularly angry looking stretch mark where the tear had been. How did... Why isn't it... See, I'm fine. I'll prove it. With that, he lay back down under the equipment. Put some more weight on. His spotter turned around and started fixing some more weights to the bar. I went to stop him, but wordlessly... Three of the wreckets who'd been silently watching stood up and took a step towards me. The spotter finished putting the extra mass on. Ryan wrapped his fingers around the scored metal 
and I heard a faint creaking, as though a tree was blowing in a gust. He took a deep breath and lifted the bar off the holder. He slowly lowered it down towards his chest and then, through gritted teeth, pushed the whole thing back up in locked arms. Repeat, repeat, repeat. It seemed to be getting easier with each rep. After six or so, he started talking. See, mate, this is why you're here. You can't stand on becoming better than you. Repeat. No, Ryan, that's not it. Repeat. Yes, it is. I'm finally not small. Repeat. Or annoying. Repeat. Or pointless. Repeat. And you hate it. I heard a tearing sound like the first cut into a new piece of card. The angry red stretch mark near his bicep had ripped open again. That same weird yellow powder was falling out. Some of the other wreckage saw this too and took a step towards us. Ryan, please, you were never... Just leave. Go cry into my sister, you sonic butt. You don't want to see what comes next. Repeat. Ryan, stop. The tear widened. Leave! Repeat. Ryan! Repeat. Go! The sound I heard next is imprinted on my mind forever. When I was seven, I spent the summer at my granddad's house, and he had this wide, fenceless front garden with a crabapple tree in the centre. I lost control of a football I'd been kicking about, and I followed it into the road without looking. There was a squeal of tyres and a blur of blue metal as a speeding car swerved onto the pavement and across my granddad's lawn straight into the tree. <laughs> the sound was unforgettable. A deep, powerful splintering of wood. And Ryan's arm snapped too, just like the tree. Ryan's arm tore off at the bicep and the weight came crashing down directly onto his chest. A tremendous cloud of light yellow powder pumped steadily out of his arm and engulfed him. I tried to rush forward and help, but two of the wreckets grabbed me and dragged me backwards towards the door. I reached out, screaming for Ryan, but more wreckets surrounded him, blocking him from view. The strip lights started shutting off. They threw me out of the door into a pothole full of oily water. I sprung up to get back in, but the door was already shut. The final lights inside went off. I stood there pounding on the door until it occurred to me to call the police. However, when they arrived and bust the door down, they found nothing. Just a bunch of wreckage pumping iron. Police searched the place but found no trace of Ryan or the mysterious steroid they appeared to be using. Five months passed. I didn't see or speak to Ryan once during that time. I was convinced he was terribly injured, or in hospital, or worse. Imagine my surprise then when I ran into him one night on a crowded tube platform while awaiting the next northbound train. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was Ryan, all right, and in one piece. Ryan, mate, what happened to you? What do you mean? I've never felt better. Where have you been? Everyone's looking for you. Everyone misses you. No, they don't. Not stupid little wasp. Not pointless, annoying wasp. Please, Ryan, I thought we got past this. No one thinks you're... Save it. I don't need your apologies. Not anymore. I've got a way to prove it. Prove what? Prove I'm not pointless. The northbound train's lights shone down the platform as it approached the station. For the love of... Ryan! No one ever said... He raised a brown, solid-looking hand and shushed me. Shh! As I said, I'll prove it. Ryan, please! But he only grinned widely again before turning towards the train and charging. And he jumped straight in front of him. I was back on my granddad's lawn again. That same sound. That same thick powerful crack a speeding vehicle makes as it plows into a block of dense wood. In an instant, what had once been Ryan became a shower of splinters and yellow powder. I choked and gasped as the substance filled the air. Commuters standing nearby started screaming. 
then fell to their knees, coughing and heaving as they too tried desperately to shield themselves from the debris. It was no use. I cradled my head in my hands and felt a shower of powder fall from my hair. I scrubbed furiously in my efforts to dislodge it and it ended up with lungs full of whatever it was. It clung to my tongue with a sour sting. That was three weeks ago. Since the day Ryan leapt to his death, others have followed suit, always jumping into the path of moving trains, always on crowded platforms, always followed by the same shower of mysterious yellow dust. Despite the alarming increase in suicides, there's been no official explanation as to why this is happening. Every day there are reports of more jumpers, in more cities. Meanwhile, I've noticed the local membership of Meats has tripled, and it keeps growing. <laughs> and I don't even lift. But everyone keeps complimenting me, telling me how ripped I'm getting. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.